Hey guys, John V here from Phone Right Now. You're watching our in-depth video review of the LG Optimus G. We have both the AT&T version and also Sprint. Both are going to be available shortly, sporting a $200 on contract price point, so very competitive. And it's worth noting that it is the very first smartphone to come to market featuring both a quad-core processor and 4G LTE connectivity, so you get the best of both worlds. On top of that, they have everything you want out of a flagship device, large displays, nice thin bodies, premium constructions, and there's a whole lot more going with them. So we're kind of curious to see how it's going to stack up against the competition and whether or not it's going to have that well-rounded performance to make it a really compelling offering. We've got to admit, the LG Optimus G is by far LG's most premium looking device to date, um, and it, go it goes in the correct evolutionary direction and improves upon the design DNA established by other handsets like the LG Optimus 4X HD and even the Prada 3.0. Now, the two versions, the AT&T Sprint ones, there are, difference there are differences between the two. Most notably, the Sprint version is more in line to the international one just because it has a, a 13 megapixel camera in the rear versus the 8 megapixel one on the AT&T version. And you can tell it's flush on the AT&T one where it's sticking out on the uh, Sprint version. On top of that, the other difference is the fact that the AT&T model is slightly wider to accommodate the micro SIM, micro SD card slots on its left side, and also has a uh, patterned uh, plastic surface on its top and bottom edges, whereas on the Sprint version, it has that uniform glossy look to it, which is complemented by the chrome trim. Definitely has a sense of elegance to design, and um, they are kind of wide in the hands, so it could be still it's still a little bit cumbersome to hold with one hand, but it still has all the qualities we love about any high-end smartphone. It's felt in frame, a good amount of weight that accompanies it, and um it has just nice premium choice materials all around. Um, we have a you know glass casing on the back, uh, which is further enhanced by the crystal reflection uh, pattern has in the rear, which uh, when you tilt it in different angles, it has a different type of optical uh, effect going on with it. So it definitely stands out, but nothing really dramatic. But for the most part, we definitely like the more premium feel of the handset versus uh, LG's previous offerings. Continuing with the trend that bigger is better, the LG Optimus G is packing a sizable 4.7 inch WXJ HD IPS Plus display and that features a resolution of 768 by 1280 pixels. So that's a little bit better than 720p and it utilizes the more favorable RGB subpixel arrangement. So of course it translates to producing some superb looking details. It's especially noticeable, most notable in the web browsers. We're able to make that even fine text in a zoomed out view. And of course it kind of helps that it has a, that pixel density of 320 pixels per inch. And seeing that it is an IPS display at heart, it, it benefits with the more natural color tones compared to the unrealistic saturated tones exhibited by other display types and even though there might be some distortion at extreme angles it's never distracting um, you know looking at the device and it's more than usable in outdoor conditions with the sun present so overall it's definitely something that shines above other displays out there. So on the left edge of both phones, we find their volume controls. We prefer the one on the Sprint version just because it's more pronounced. It has a more responsive feel. Uh, but the AT&T version packs a micro SIM, micro SD card slot, which are hidden behind a plastic flap. Well, on the opposite side, we only find their dedicated power buttons. Again, it's the Sprint version that has the more distinctive feel between the two. But with the AT&T one, it doubles as a notification light as well because it has a red glow whenever we get any type of notification. We also like the added sense of sophistication added to the LG Optimus G thanks to the star screws found at the bottom of uh, the edges here. On top of that, they both feature the microphones and micro USB ports for charging data connectivity. And it's worth noting that you, you can get video app functionality with the aid of an MHL adapter. And of course, on the top edges of both handsets, we have their 3.5mm headset jacks and their noise cancellation microphones. Meanwhile, above their displays, we find their narrow earpieces, front-facing 1.3 megapixel cameras, which has the ability to shoot 720p videos. And with the Sprint version, its notification LED light is perched nearby the uh, camera. And finally, in the rears, we find the respective cameras. As we mentioned already, it's a higher 13 megapixel camera on the Sprint version, and it's raised above the surrounding area. In contrast, the AT&T one has an 8 megapixel camera, which is flush to the surface. Both have LED flashes and have the ability to shoot 1080p videos. Again, there's no access to their 2100 milliamp hour battery, seeing that it's a closed design. Uh, but as far as storage capacities are concerned, the Sprint version is packing 32 gigabytes of internal storage, whereas on the uh, AT&T version, it breaks down to 16GB of internal and another 16GB micro SD card. 
We've never been fans of LG's custom Android interfaces in the past on other devices, but this time around they do make some improvements going the correct direction, but overall it still doesn't quite leap uh, what we've seen already with the competition out there. In general, as far as the overall styling of the UI, it still has that very cartoony-like look with it, um, especially with the uh, App Pal, nothing different about it. It's your traditional grid-like view, but we do appreciate some of the eye candy that it has to offer, specifically the cool transition effects in play with it. It's rich personal personalization with the various widgets out there, but nothing really on a grand scale. And you can even customize even a type of, uh, you know, uh, animation going on with the home screen panel if you'd like. With the lock screen, it's also nice just because uh, you get a large clock like so. You can quickly launch any of the uh, preset applications right down below. And you have also this cool looking effect going on as you're trying to unlock the device. And finally, with the notifications panel, it's just nice having access to some of the uh, connectivity of features of the handset directly from within there as opposed to going through through the usual menu settings and whatnot. We'll talk more about some of the specific new items found with the uh, custom interface running on top of Android 4.0 ice cream sandwich but for the most part it's a nice improvement versus previous offerings but doesn't quite you know go beyond what we've seen out there. So the first new feature we're going to show you here is the Q-Slide function with the interface and it's basically the handset's way of video multitasking. So let's say for example we're going to watch a video, a high definition video, we could press the button up top and what it does, it places the video up top and gives us the slider where it would change the transparency of the video to make it less noticeable or more pronounced. At the same time we're doing that, we could be doing other things like sending an email, we could be browsing the web, but the problem with it is that it never, it proves to be a little bit on a distracting side just because our attention is never placed on one thing uh, you know at, at any given moment and it doesn't really make for the great experience just because of that transparency uh, we're kind of obstructed from the view of what's playing in the video. Likewise, the dual screen, dual play feature found with the interface works on the same premise as the Q-Slide function. Basically, you connect the handset to a television via an HDMI connection using an MHL adapter. From here, let's say for example, you could be watching a video, you could play video, it'll be playing on your high definition TV, and on the handset, what you'll see is just you could do whatever you want, so it's, uh, you know, it's performing two tasks at once. So on one hand, you'll have the video playing the high def television, and on the phone, you could be doing something else, you could be browsing the web, you could be composing a text. At the same time, you could do other useful things like uh, playing a slideshow, a PowerPoint slideshow on a TV, and on your phone itself, you could be reading off notes. It's definitely usable in some aspects. So with the live zooming feature with the interface, it works with playing videos again. So as you're watching something on your handset, you can do a pinch gesture to zoom into the video as much as you want. So you can have a little bit more detail on what you're looking at. Now, I'll tell you the truth, it's not something that's really too practical to use or something we find that we'll be using quite often, but it's an added benefit there for some people out there. Uh, but it's worth knowing that it's probably best for 1080p videos just because with lower quality stuff, if you zoom in, it tends to degrade the quality. Similar to uh, live zooming, the screen zooming function with the interface works in the same manner, but it works on some applications, not all. For example, if you're in the gallery, if you're looking through your photos, you could do pinch gestures to actually zoom in, zoom out out of uh, you know the gallery itself. The same thing applies to uh, text messaging. You could actually increase, decrease the size of the font just by doing pinch gesture at any time. And even works with the email application as well. You could pinch zoom like so, so you could actually uh, see more of the text a little bit easier in the eyes. But in all honesty, it's not something we'd use that often. And finally, the last new feature we're going to show you here is the Quick Memo f feature, which is something we've seen already on the LG Intuition and even the Escape, where it's basically a notating, note-taking application. You could access it by pressing the um, icon in the notifications panel, or at any time just pressing the, uh, uh, the simultaneously pressing the volume up and volume down. What happens is it takes a capture of the screenshot, and what from here we could do uh, different things. We could doodle, you know, on the screen. We could write something down. It's great for on a phone call, and we have to quickly write something down we could press the overlay mode to show you exactly what we're writing and from here we could you know um, we could save it so we could look at it later on Already we've kind of demoed the processing power of the LG Optimus G, which is attributed to its uh, quad-core uh, 1.5 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon S4 Pro chipset. It's coupled with two gigabytes of RAM, so it has a really fast processor, a lot of RAM too, and honestly, this is the snappiest device we've checked out thus far. You can even tell, even with the, with the live wallpaper and all the cool transition effects in play, it is moving relatively fast. And other basic tasks, whether it's opening up applications, 
uh, we're browsing the web, we're checking out a video, stuff like that, even gaming to extent, it is uh, really quick with its response. And honestly, this is a speed demon in every way, and the benchmark scores even show that. Unfortunately though, LG doesn't make any great strides in enhancing the experience with the core set of organizer applications with the LG Optimus G. So whether you're using things like the calculator to the calendar or even the clock, there's nothing different about them. It's your typical experience that we've seen on other handsets. At the same time, there's nothing particularly new with the email experience on the LG Optimus G aside from the screen zooming function with the standard email application. But nevertheless, you have all the full fidelity of features found with the Gmail experience, so it's quite similar to the desktop experience, and it's more than useful. Obviously, with its sizable display, it makes for a wonderful experience when it comes to typing up messages with its on-screen keyboard just because you have a sizable layout, very spacious, on top that's super responsive. Now, with the AT&T version, you have two options. You can either use the LG keyboard or the stock ice cream sandwich one. With the LG keyboard, you have a swipe-like function as well as an alternative, but with the Sprint version, you're only given the LG keyboard. As we know, the most noteworthy thing about the LG Optimus G is the fact that it is the first smartphone to combine a quad-core processor and 4G LTE connectivity. So when it comes to the web browsing experience, you, you can accept nothing but uh, the best with it. Uh, so you have two different options. You can either use the stock or web browser here, which has support for Flash, so you get that desktop-like experience. Or as an alternative, you could use the Chrome browser, which is also still more than useful. But either way, both are wonderful just because you get fast data speeds thanks to LTE. And on top of that, very responsive navigational controls. And with this stock browser, even with flash content on screen, it's not slowing down whatsoever. Sadly, there's no love given to the music player with the LG Optimus G. It lacks any visual presentation to really make it a compelling offering, and by default, it looks rather conventional by today's standards. Nothing really pretty about it. As far as the audio quality with its uh, speaker, it's loud, but at the highest volume setting, it tends to have a little bit sharpness to it. Luckily, though, you could, e you could use the uh, Google Play Music application as an alternative, and with that, you have different equalizer settings to better, uh, you know, enhance the audio quality. Not surprisingly, the LG Optimus G handles high-definition videos with no problems at all. Out of the box, it supports a wide variety of codecs. The one we have here is encoded in XVID 1920x1080 resolution. With its sizable display, high resolution, and fast processor, it essentially translates to a one phenomenal experience just because it plays smoothly, a lot of detail, good clarity, good colors too, so it wins in many aspects. So here's the camera you want on the LG Optimus G, and the nice thing about it, there's a lot of different shooting modes and manual settings available to it, so you can adjust things like the uh, brightness, the focus, the image size, the various scene modes. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility for people who are really into taking photographs. On top of that, some nice additional features. For example, you have this option here when you press the icon, the cheese shutter, so you can take a, a photo by just simply saying cheese or any of these selected words right there, so uh, you don't have to worry about you know bubbling around pressing the on-screen shutter key. At the same time, there's also another cool feature called Time Catch Shot, which basically captures the moments before you're pressing the shutter key. So basically, it's snapping photos silently in the background, so when you press the button to take a snapshot, it'll give the option to check out some additional photos prior to that one. After everything we checked out with the LG Optimus G, the most disappointing part is the underwhelming results found with its camera, both the 13 megapixel one and the 8 megapixel one, the AT&T version. As far as details go, we tend to notice a little bit more over sharpening with the AT&T version, but it's still pretty poor in general, just because it tends to appear very muddy, especially with the uh, things in the background. As far as color production, the AT&T version sports a little bit more saturated tones, whereas the Sprint one tends to be more on the natural side. Indoors under heavy artificial lighting colors are very washed out looking and in really low lighting conditions it's a lot of graininess loss of details and of course some noise that that kind of shows up in the shots as far as the LED flash it's very potent but unfortunately though it doesn't turn on prior to taking a shot so it tends to make the images come out a little bit out of focus 
Similarly, we're disappointed also with the 1080p high definition video recording out of the LG Optimus G, both on the AT&T and Sprint versions, just because it is really lacking on the, in the details department. And it's a far cry from being regarded as high definition. We do like that it, it records audio very clearly and that it moves swiftly at 30 frames per second. But some other noticeable distractions include the heavy amount of artifacting when we're panning both quickly and very slowly, and it does take a long time to adjust its focus. It's a mixed bag when it comes to call quality on both devices. First and foremost, their earpieces are pretty strong, so we're able to hear our callers. But with the Sprint version, it's flawed by a few different things. First of all, uh, voices through the earpiece have a little bit of a hollowness to them. Our callers complain that our voice sounds a little bit on the muffled side on their end of the line. And when we switch to using a speakerphone on both handsets, it tends to exhibit some squeakiness at the loudest volume setting. Luckily though, the AT&T version fares a little bit better just because on both ends of the line, voices are more clear and distinct with no distortion whatsoever. With the 2100 mAh batteries inside the two handsets, it produces average battery life to tell you the truth. Uh, in fact, uh, with the Sprint version, it's worth knowing that we use it strictly with uh, 3G EVDO connections and with the AT&T one with HSPA+, just because we don't have LTE coverage in our area. So we're able to get by a solid day out of normal usage, and by the end of the day, the AT&T version we find it at the 30% level, whereas the Sprint, Sprint one's a little bit lower because we're in a lower coverage area compared to AT&T, but of course, if you're going to be using an LTE, you can expect those figures to drop tremendously. For once, it seems as though LG's fortunes might finally turn around when it comes to the high-end market with Android smartphones, just because they have a really compelling offering with the LG Optimus G. Not for the fact that it's uh, the first smartphone for the, that packs a quad-core processor with 4G LTE connectivity, but they really made some headway in making the software experience more complete compared to what they've done in the past. And honestly, the LG Optimus G is also the most premium feeling device that we've checked out of late uh, from LG's camp. It has a nice design. Design, good choice of materials. It has all the uh, requirements to make it a really fantastic high-end smartphone. Good spec sheet, of course, but still lacking that well-rounded performance to make it, you know, a viable competitor compared to some of the other devices out there. Kind of stutters when it comes to taking photos and videos. But the other thing that we like about it is that they considerably improve the software experience to make it a lot more comforting to what we've seen them do in the past. So it's definitely nice in that aspect, but still has a lot of work in, you know, uh, fending off the competition, namely what we've seen already put out by Samsung, it's Galaxy Note 2, but we're going to see some more additional smartphones coming out with quad-core processors and OLT connectivity, so it's uh, only going to be a matter of time before it really gets heated up. But for $200, you're getting a good amount of value with the LG Optimus G. So if you'd like to learn more about it, guys, check out our website, phonerena.com. This is John V. Thanks for watching.